the Director of Sustainability at American University. Um, but I want to thank Aaron, who really actually organized all this, um, who's, I don't know if this is okay to say, to have, you're not supposed to have favorites, but um, Aaron is definitely one of the leading students in the, uh, we have a master's program at AU, some of you are recognized who are in it, um, called the Sustainability Management Master's Program in our Kogod School of Business, um, and Aaron is getting ready to graduate in May. Um, so he organized this panel, and um, so thanks to him for taking that leadership and doing that, and he asked me to moderate. So I'm happy to play that role. Um, the first thing I want to do is, um, before we get to introducing our distinguished panel, is um, brag a little bit. So we're going to brag a little bit about what we're doing about energy efficiency at American University. Um, some of you have been involved in that, in fact. Um, but what, instead of me bragging, I'm actually going to let one of our panelists sort of brag, which is, I want to play a little video here. <laughs> let the video do the bragging. <laughs> The city was originally chartered by Congress to further interests of national significance. Sustainability, carbon neutrality, these are all issues that are on the national agenda. From that standpoint, not only is it good business sense, but it's also politically and socially responsible thing to do. We have a green building policy that requires that all of our new buildings have to be built to at least the gold standards. So that kind of takes care of the new construction part of things. Um, for existing buildings, though, we also are working on a lead volume project to try to certify 25 existing buildings on campus. So we are one of three universities in the world currently working on a lead volume program of this magnitude. Here at American University, we work with Bender Arena, which is in the heart of the campus, which is a sports facility, also a convening place where people have commencement exercises and other activities. In the arena, NCAA, basketball, auditorium, televised games. We have 50 plus thousand watt metal halo fixtures burning essentially 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In any lighting project, you have a lot of opportunities that you can, you can go different ways. And in this one, they went ahead and they upgraded the lighting first, then incorporated a control system to allow them better function and control over the new space. The thing that, you know, beyond the fun that DC, SEU, you know, besides the communication and keeping us informed of what's going on in the district, probably most valuable, I find, is, is the engineering to do those exact same kind of life cycle cost analysis. I just call up Danielle and I say, hey, you know, can you help out with these? And she says, sure, no problem. The DCSEU presents an important uh, and exciting opportunity to see energy efficiency advance and grow in the region. This combination of the DCSEU working with American University really helps us accomplish a number of our goals in terms of reducing peak demand for electricity as well as reducing overall consumption in the District of Columbia. One of our highest level goals is achieving carbon neutrality by 2020. Our first strategy is reducing energy consumption on campus. It takes a little additional effort, but the more you try to do it really well, the more you eliminate bad decision making, waste, and for a nominal additional cost, what you do is you achieve something really special. American University is a leader in the sustainability movement. The mayor has put out a challenge, and the presidents of all of the universities here in the District of Columbia have challenged each other to step up. I want them to look at American universities' lead. <laughs> and um, so, one of the guest, one of the starring roles in that video is in the room, Emily Curley. <coughs> Take it out here. Yay, Emily! <laughs> Emily's been working on our green building program, as you heard about, uh, which you know, when it comes down to it, uh, really one of the keys to lead certification, which is part of what's driving a lot of our um, efforts, is energy efficiency. Um, reducing energy consumption is really. And without giving short shrift to other environmental impacts of buildings, energy is responsible for the lion's share of the environmental impacts. Um, so reducing energy consumption and sourcing energy from renewable sources has been a lot of what our office does. Um, and we've been happy to be partnering with the DC Sustainable Energy Utility. Um, but let me uh, 
turn it over to the panel. So I want to introduce um, our, our panel on the business case for energy efficiency. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to try to go in order from left to right here, but this is the first time I'm meeting you, so I'm trying to match this with faces that I don't know. So Katiri Callahan, uh -huh. um, who's the president of the Alliance to Save Energy, and actually, I don't know if you two know each other, but uh, yeah. Emily, Emily is an alumni, yes, as is Erin. I was happy to steal her, so thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were not happy to lose her. Um, and Kurt Rich, who's the vice president of energy and environmental policy at United Technologies Corporation. Danielle Griffin, who you saw in the film, um, who manages the commercial accounts for the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, uh, which she'll tell you more, more about. Matt Banks, who's the manager for climate and business at World Wildlife Fund, and I think we have some offline things I'd love to talk about. Um, so hopefully you'll have a few minutes afterwards that we can do that. Yeah. Um, and finally, uh, Gina Davis, who's the founder Dennis. and CEO mm -hmm. of Relirians. Dennis? Sorry? Dennis. Dennis. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Gina Dennis, um, who's the founder and CEO of Relirians, um, which is an international green consulting company. So I'd like to turn it over first um, to Kurt. Okay. And I think you have some slides. Is that right? I do. Do you want me to? Sure. Hey. I'll just yeah, I'll it from here. Yeah. Let me step aside. Oh, you're give me a quick sequel. Uh, arrow keys are probably easiest. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming on a, uh, on a Thursday night. I know that you probably have other things that are more enticing, but uh, I think this will be a great, uh, great conversation. I'm looking forward to, to all of the panelists hearing what they have to say about green buildings, something that, uh, that I think a lot about and, and think is very important. So I'm with United Technologies. Um, a lot of you uh, know our products, but probably have no idea who United Technologies is. We're really known by our brands. Uh, we, uh, we, we operate in kind of two areas, playing off of two mega trends. Urbanization, so building systems, carrier heating and cooling, Otis elevator, kit of fire products, automated logics, building controls, and increased air travel. As you become more urbanized, you, you fly more. So Pratt & Whitney jet engines, uh, Sikorsky helicopter, and then United Technologies Aerospace Systems, which is the largest content provider to the commercial airline industry in the world. So things like brakes and electrical controls, uh, automa automatic pilot uh, systems, uh, emergency uh, uh, shoots, uh, and, and the like. You know, if you think about the products that we make, really the, the, kind of at, at the core, you really want to drive efficiency and, 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 and high in environmental performance into all of these, into, into these products, be it a, a, an air conditioner or a jet engine. And when you're making products that really uh, place a premium on high energy and environmental performance, you want to make sure that your, that your operations are, are as green as they can possibly be. And so uh, our company, a $70 billion company with more than 220,000 employees, uh, more than 400 manufacturing facilities, we really put a premium on it investing in energy efficiency at the plant level. And to give you just kind of a frame of reference of, of, of the progress we've made to date, that between 2006 and today, we have reduced overall energy use at all of our facilities worldwide by almost 30 percent. We've done that at the same time as we've grown from being a 48 billion dollar company to a 70 billion dollar company. So we've increased by about half, but in absolute terms we've reduced our energy use by by 30 percent. And that really that goes to the bottom line. We want to be a good corporate citizen, but at the end of the day it's just a, a, it's, it's good business to be, to be green, to be energy efficient. You guys have probably seen these numbers, but just, just a reminder that within the built environment, buildings consume about 40% of all uh, energy. They account for about 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you know, our old CEO liked to say that when you look at uh, all of the products that United Technologies offers between air conditioning systems, elevators, and jet engines, 
that we account for about, as a company, 1% of all CO2 emissions in the world wow. in, our, in the products that they use. So again, uh, we think a lot about how our products perform and how we can reduce CO2 emissions in their performance. That's at the company level. On kind of a macro level, uh, lo looking at the green building, the growth of the, the green building industry. And I think there are two kind of interesting uh, conclusions that you, can, that you can draw from this graph. And this, this shows the growth of the green commercial uh, building sector over the past roughly 10 years. In 2005, green buildings, commercial sector, green buildings accounted for about 2% of the market. By 2015, green buildings will account for 50% of the market. They're just incredible growth. I think even more remarkable, particularly for a company that, that really uh, pays close attention to both residential and commercial building, uh, building market, is that during the recession, 2000, late 2008 through 2011, while overall construction dropped precipitously, precipitously Green building construction continued to increase. So we saw a growth in green building construction over that same period. So again, it's smart to, as a business matter, to really focus on, on green buildings. Now, I've talked briefly about uh, how we manufacture green products in green facilities. We're focused on the, uh, on the built environment to, to drive drive green building products, I thought I'd give you an example of, a, of another way that we think about efficiency. And how do I do this here? I'll just hit the arrow key. Just next one. I know. You might need to Fifteen years of company research and development, Pratt & Whitney introduced the geared turbofan to the commercial market. The first year that they, that they offered it for sale, 2010, that engine took 50% of new jet engine commercial orders worldwide. The reason why? That engine's 20% more fuel efficient, 50% more uh, noise efficient, so noise emissions reduced by 50% and reduces NOx emissions by 75%. So if you're an airliner and you're buying new airplanes with new engines, reduced jet fuel burn of 20% means if you're, if you're flying a 737, a million dollars in, in lower uh, fuel costs each year. Reduced noise emissions mean that you can fly more direct routes. You can fly, fly the plane earlier in the morning, later at night. Again, efficiency. So when we think about efficiency, we're talking about energy efficiency today, but to energy efficiency, it's environmental efficiency, it's noise efficiency. And so as a, as a manufacturer, we look to drive efficiency in every product that we make, and we construe efficiency broadly. So, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. I think I've got some follow-ups for you, too, once we get into the conversation. Because um, we, well, I'll hold it, because um, we want to hear from the rest of the panelists first. So uh, just, just so folks know, we're gonna, we'll are gonna we hear short remarks from these panelists, as we just did from Kurt, and then we'll have plenty of time for conversation. So if I can get back to, here we go. Uh, was there another, was there an order after the PowerPoint? Okay, so I'm going to just go left to right here. <laughs> Jerry? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, let me thank Aaron for inviting me here and, again, recognize Emily Curley as a 
I think she was a four-year veteran of the Alliance to Save Energy. So um, let me just, and in, in, I'll try to make this very brief, tell you a little bit about the Alliance to Save Energy, what we're focused on right now, and then what I was asked by Erin to do was to give my um, hope for you all tonight in terms of a walk away and what you, what you will want to remember from this evening. So first about the Alliance. Um, we have been in the energy efficiency business for almost 40 years now. We were created uh, during the first energy crisis in the U.S. with the oil embargo. Most of you weren't born then. Um, and the idea behind the alliance was that if we were going to really address the significant issues, environmental, economic, energy security, or security around our use of energy, that we needed an alliance, and ergo the name, the Alliance to Save Energy. And the alliance needed to be between policymakers, between business, labor groups and public interest sector. Um, we are an NGO uh, unique to the NGO world. I think we were formed by two sitting members of Congress, two senators, a Republican and a Democrat. So we have in our culture and in our DNA, if you will, being nonpartisan and trying to find solutions that appeal very broadly in terms of tackling those issues surrounding energy use. So. We look at uh, energy efficiency as a no regrets policy, if you will, and also look at energy efficiency as the country's largest available resource for addressing our energy needs. And why do I say that? Since we began the Alliance to Save Energy and over the course of the last four decades, through improvements in technology and through policy innovation, like building energy codes, appliance equipment standards, cafe standards, we've been able to shave off the need for 50 quads of energy. What does that mean? That's about half of what we use to power this country's economy every year. So it also means that we are saving, as consumers and as businesses, about $450 billion a year in avoided energy costs from the energy we no longer waste. It also means we're saving about 2 billion tons of CO2 from being put up into the atmosphere. That's a big number I'm throwing at you. What does it mean? Just to give you an equivalent, we started measuring CO2 emissions in the United States in 1958, the year I was born. Go figure how old I am now in Hawaii. And when we started measuring in 1958, that was the world's level of emissions the world's level, two billion, and so we've been able to shave that off in the course of time. The, both the benefit and the gain, or the, the benefit and the, the challenge, is that we as the United States uh, continue to waste energy in an unfathomable shape. We waste more than 50% of the energy we use. Some estimates go as much as 80%. That means there's a lot of opportunity still that we can uh, that we can tap into. So energy efficiency becomes that continuous, like the gift that keeps giving, the low-hanging fruit remains there. So the Alliance is focused right now on trying to get the rest of the waste out of the system. And we have adopted as a goal doubling energy productivity in the United States between now and the year 2030. Energy productivity, if you need that defined, you guys are all smarter than me, I'm sure, but what that means is we will get twice as much value or GDP out of each unit of energy that we're using today. So two times the value, two times the GDP for each unit of energy that's, that we use and consume. Um, we have a, a, a set of recommendations on how to do that. It's industry-wide. Uh, one of the reasons that we took the goal of not reducing energy consumption in the U.S., but looked at energy productivity, is we wanted it to be intuitive to people, smart people like you and Joe Sixpack on the street, that we're not just looking at reducing emissions, reducing energy consumption, we're looking at improving the economy, because that's where everybody's attention is focused right now. Um, so again, we see energy efficiency as a win-win-win. There's if we are able to double energy productivity, and by the way, uh, NREL was on our commission to look at this issue. They say that we not only can do that, we can do it even better with the right policy framework. Um, we, the Energy Information Administration says that just on a business as usual case, with changes in technology and investment, we're going to see a 57 percent improvement in energy productivity between now and 2030. So, you know, we see the glide path and we see the, the way to do it. 
we believe that the way to engage people on this is to talk to them in economic terms. So we had an economic analysis done. If we double energy productivity, it means $327 billion in savings to the economy that we can put in place other ways. It means the creation of 1.3 million jobs. It means an improvement in GDP percentage rate by 2% per annum in 2030. Um, and it means very, very importantly, from my mind at least, but it's not all often the, the great first selling point on this, we'll reduce CO2 emissions to a third below where they were in 2005, even as we've grown the economy. So just like United Technologies saw, they can grow their business, they can reduce emissions in, in, in real terms from where they were before and still have an economic gain. And I think that's what and where the traction is. So that's what I want to leave you all with if there's a message to be taken away from this, it is that we can improve the economy through energy efficiency. We can improve energy security, meaning we don't have to import as much energy to, to meet our demand because we're meeting it with reductions in waste. And we can improve our environment all at the same time. So there's not a reason not to do this. It is a no regrets policy, but what will drive it is the economics of it and that's what you're seeing in the business community and that's where I think we win the day. So if nothing else, think about getting into this business because it is the business of the future. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for your loss being <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, We're happy Danielle. to give them up. Thanks. Um, so uh, the DC Sustainable Energy Utility has actually partnered with AU on a number of energy efficiency projects. Uh, so tell us a little bit of, and, and as a rate payer um, yeah. in DC, I know that part of my um, dollars go to fund the DC SEU. Tell us a little bit more. Tell me about where those dollars go, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you for having me uh, first, and I'm, I'm actually quite honored to be on the panel. These are uh, very important people in the energy and the environmental arena that Aaron was able to uh, get twice, I think, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I'm just curious kind of who we have in the audience. I mean, I know it's a business school event today, but uh, are there, are there, is there a mixed audience, or are we mostly, mostly business students, or? I'm in the School of Public Affairs. Public Affairs. Um, International work, public affairs, and I think we have peace and conflict resolution, and we have some guests from the community. So, um, I think that you are actually a good representation of this, uh, the direction that this this type of work is headed. Um, uh, Kurt is in a in work that is highly technical. A lot of engineers, um, Fortune 500, I, I think. Luckily, I'm a lobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Kateri, I you know, have a lot of respect for Kateri. She is on uh, numerous panels. I think she's been doing this work for about 25 years plus. Um, and uh, Gina, I just met, but she's a CEO of her own firm. Um, and I think we have, we have work to, uh, to do on an introduction because I was coming in late. <laughs> but World Wildlife Federation um, will probably be able to speak a little bit to the environmental components of the work that we do. So. DCSEU stands for the DC Sustainable Energy Utility. Um, it is uh, about three years in the making now. Um, it is the energy efficiency utility for Washington, DC. Um, does anybody know what an energy efficiency utility is? I think probably up here. <laughs> so um, you have your traditional power generating utility. So you, know, you might be used to PEPCO. Uh, in this case, and, uh, and big coal and uh, transmission discussions. So the, they're generating utilities. An energy efficiency utility is solely tasked with uh, um, normally energy savings reductions for uh, a particular area. And our particular niche is in mu uh, serving municipalities. And, uh, and so DC asked us to come on board a couple of years ago and lead the charge to start what, we, what they considered a new kind of utility. So not to just address um, not to just address energy savings, but to also take on some socioeconomic uh, problems that the district was having. So, thank you. So, um, what is our office? Can I just talk a little bit about what our office looks like? We're we're a pretty small group. We're not your traditional utility. We're at the you know Pepco's got probably 11, 11 stories and a lot of folks. 
We're about 15 people strong now. We were, it's, really a, it's really a business startup environment, which is kind of my background, very entrepreneurial. And I got to come down three years ago and start this up. And it's now quite robust. As you can see, American University was a recipient, uh, the first year recipient of NEEP stands for the Northeastern Energy Efficiency Partnership. And Kateri knows about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, NEEP had never awarded an Efficiency Leader Award this far south before. So uh, AU is on the map. And uh, that's a kind of an example of some of the work that we do um, in energy savings projects um, and then some other programs that I guess I can get into more depth later. Oh, you can yeah. speak a little bit about now. Well, um, up to you. Okay. No, I, th I think that's that's pretty good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and uh, yeah. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to come and, and um, chat with you today. My name is Matt Banks. I've been in Washington for about 11 years, uh, in the role at World Wildlife Fund of managing our business engagement on climate change. Um, Back in 1999, uh, WWF, which is the world's largest conservation organization, identified climate as the biggest threat to our mission. So we've been working across hundreds of ecoregions around the world to maintain biodiversity, um, prevent habitat loss, prevent species decline. And it was decided that, that climate was the biggest threat to that mission, whether it's the Amazon, the Congo, the Arctic, you name it. And so at that time, um, Brian Castelli, oh, who was at the Alliance, or who was um, just out of the federal government, mm -hmm. together with his partner, Jill Rahm, um, and my mentor, Rebecca Eaton, um, who had spent time at GE, decided to come to WWF and establish this program called Climate Savers. And um, a few years later, they were looking for someone to do um, new partner acquisition. And I had spent time working as Mayor Menino's um, climate and energy advisor in the city of Boston. I worked doing a lot of climate communications for a big federal contractor called Eastern Research Group. Um, and decided to, I was flying back and forth so much to DC that I decided maybe it was time to move to DC. <laughs> um, so I applied for this position back then. And at that time we had two partners. It was really just Johnson & Johnson and IBM. Um, and the, the goal was to get them to set a target to reduce their emissions, put that into a legally binding contract that committed to them to that goal, develop an action plan, much the way that I had done for Boston. Um, and so since that time, we've grown the program from two companies to 30 companies around the world. And those companies have now delivered over 100 million metric tons of emissions reductions. Uh, so that's like taking 30 million cars off the road or double the annual emissions of a mid-sized European country. Um, so that, that program um, has now been expanded around the world. It started in the US really to, to serve as a business case we could take to Capitol Hill um, and show folks that you could you know, cut your emissions and prosper at the same time, that it wasn't going to bankrupt the American economy or um, companies in general. So over time, we grew this program with Nike, HP, Sony, Nokia. Um, our latest partner just uh, this week is Novellus, a large aluminum uh, company. And so we're across basically 30 sectors. The idea was to create a model company in each sector that, that others could, could model. Um, so that's kind of my journey, a uh, little bit about w WWF. Um, and then I think the thing that we're most proud about is a few years ago, our board, our national council, and our executive team said, how can you go from 30 companies to 3,000 companies? How do you take this thing to scale? Climate savers. And so we connected with some other NGOs and started thinking about, you know, what are the best practices that we've learned from this portfolio of companies that others could learn from? And together with McKinsey and the Carbon Disclosure Project, um, Right around this time last year, we released this action plan or roadmap, if you will, called the 3% Solution. And what the 3% Solution is about is a pathway that if all of corporate America reduced emissions by about 3% per year mm -hmm. from now until 2020, 
we could meet the scientific recommendations that are coming from the international um, climate bodies like the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we could do it profitably. We could save over $780 billion across the economy. So I'll, I won't get into a lot more detail on that. There's a lot of interesting learnings. Uh, maybe we can talk about that later on. Um, but uh, the other striking thing about this analysis is that it's a limited time offer. If we reduce emissions about 3% per year from now until 2020, it's a 3% reduction. If we wait and we don't scale things up until 2030, it's a 10% reduction per year. And if we, um, sorry, if we wait until 2020, it's about a 10% reduction thereafter. If we wait until 2030, the carbon budget is gone. It's about a 100% reduction per year. So there's really a short window of opportunity over the course of the next seven to 10 years where we can do something meaningful that is climate relevant and fits the context that we're in from a scientific perspective. Hi, good evening. My name is Gina Dennis. I am the CEO of Reliance. Reliance is a green <coughs> energy strategy company that I created five years ago. I am a graduate of American University. I graduated from the law school over a decade ago in 2003. Woo! And I'm really proud to say that people think I'm like 20. I'm like, I'm not 20, I promise. I'm a lot older than that. So that's why I emphasize over a decade. Um, and I also received my MBA from Kodog. In 2005, that did the, the JD and VA duel. Um, after law school, I started working for a law firm right away doing international trade work and environmental regulatory work, um, super fun liability stuff for gas stations, representing Neiman Marcus on fur endangered species issues. And then I went to another firm um, and I started doing international work related to Africa financial policy, representing um, a sovereign wealth fund on um, huge commercial acquisitions of very large properties. Um, and I kept seeing this, this four-letter word pop up everywhere, L-E-E-D, lead. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so all of, the, all of the financing documents, all of the leases, um, all of the uh, purchase and sale agreements, everything seemed to kind of run into this four-letter word, lead. So I thought, wow, you know, this is kind of an opportunity um, to make this a consulting thing. And so in 2009, I got the LEAD Accredited Professional Certification, LEAD AP, and I opened my company um, in February 2009. And we started off doing just lead green building work, advisory, um, schools, some charter schools came to us and solder services. Um, I, we also did trainings and, um, and then we started doing survey analysis of green buildings and looking at the energy savings track record to see whether or not lead buildings actually yield the outcome that is supposed to be expected. Um, and then from there, um, I've been traveling a lot, uh, marketing my company in Brazil. Brazil has adopted LEED, the Green Building Standard. Um, I was traveling back and forth from June to October in South Sudan. South Sudan is the newest country in the world. And they don't really have a grid because they have like zero infrastructure. So I was there trying to convince their government to adopt a green energy grid and create it, but then there was an attempted coup, and so I had to leave. <laughs> um, and since then, I, my company has been working on a lead green building certification project across the street from the convention center. It's a building that's owned by the DC government, and um, it's actually it's a 20,000 square foot building, and it's a pretty big project, and it's going to be the first women's shelter one of the first women's shelters that is actually energy efficient. Um, and uh, we also do green energy business planning. About a year ago, um, we put on a big conference um, where we advise companies on ways to actually generate revenue off of their green energy strategies or energy efficiency strategies. Because a lot of times the focus on energy efficiency is just reducing costs, reducing costs. Well, 
what if you could also make money off of reducing your costs? So uh, we have a whole approach on revenue strategies for companies who are landowners, who are in the hospitality industry, uh, who are retailers, uh, who are manufacturers, who have an operations side. On their operations side, it's they need to cut costs. And then on their consumer side, they need to sell products, they need to sell um, uh, goods, they need to sell services, they need to sell a venue. And so we uh, train businesses on ways to expand their revenue approach to energy efficiency so that they can communicate to their customers and find ways to get more customers off of the fact that they are actually using energy efficiency methods in their business operations. And Terry McAuliffe was the guest speaker at that time. That was before he became the governor. And he actually had just been kind of um, he had just been on the stump at that time um, campaigning, and uh, um, so that was exciting. Um, and so what we also do is we advise suppliers um, in green building projects. So you can't have a green building unless you have green technology, energy efficient, energy efficient technology, eco-friendly materials. And a lot of times construction companies will come to us asking how is it that the supplies materials, products they're using in the building are going to meet the architect's specifications for the project. So we work with these construction companies and their suppliers to make sure that the products are in compliance with, um, with the architect's specifications. And what I mean is, see, a lead green building project, one side of it has to do with energy efficiency. The other side has to do with eco-friendly materials and recycling efforts. So the goal is to get 75%, even up to 95% of all the construction waste on the project to get that recycled. So there's a focus literally during the project to make sure things are done in an eco-friendly way. And then the materials themselves, making sure that the paints have low VOC content, low vol volatile organic compound content, or making sure that there's recycled content inside of the materials. Like concrete naturally has recycled content, or steel naturally has recycled content. So lead green building, uh, it does have a place for energy efficiency, but it also has a full out sustainability side that has to do with just 100% um, eco-friendly materials. And um, so essentially that's what my company does in a nutshell. And um, one of the things I, I do want to emphasize though is that when we talk about energy efficiency um, and its link to sustainability, it is important to remember that it is not a political contest. This does not have to be an issue of Democrats versus Republicans at all. This has to do with, and it is about economics. Mm -hmm. It has to do with economics, and it has to do with being in the 21st century. You don't have to care at all about the environment, at all. But if you want to know where your lights are going to, how your lights are going to come on in the next 20 years, then I think this is something you need to pay attention to. If you're a manufacturer, and you're making lots of money selling your products, but you're spending millions of dollars every year on utility bills, then this is something you should probably pay attention to, especially if you're a CFO. So um, when we talk about energy efficiency, it is a business case, without a doubt. It is about numbers. And the beautiful thing about energy efficiency is if you pay attention to those numbers, you save that money, you, and you also increase your revenue stream, the outcome is you also protect the environment. So it's um, it's it's win win and win. Um, so that's that's pretty much my little speech. Thank you. So we've got global corporations, environmental NGOs, entrepreneurs. We have such a breadth of experience here that I have a really long list of questions. Um, so I'm going to try to focus on just a few that have that really focus on the business case for energy efficiency and I want to make sure that we have an opportunity for um, audience members to ask questions. So let me, but let me start off with one which is uh, just to put it kind of crudely, energy efficiency is basically money sitting on the table waiting to be picked up. Why aren't more people picking it up? And this is for the whole, the, anyone on the panel. 
You want to start? I, yeah, I, I can I start. It's like my favorite topic. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that a lot of our messaging is not focused on the environment any longer. And this report really um, kind of took WWF in a new direction. You won't see the word you won't see the word climate in here very much. Um, the focus is on cost savings and. Um, we have tried to use McKinsey's language from here on. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, there's three barriers that McKinsey's identified. Lack of management attention, um, access to capital, and um, lack of expertise. And the way that this plays out in a lot of the energy management functions that our counterparts at the likes of Coke or Nike or HP have seen is they often have to compete for capital and they take a project to their CFO. And it doesn't look the same as some of the other ones. It may be not at the same, um, so, not of the same size. It's not the kind of thing that helps the company from a growth perspective. It's, it's more of a, a savings opportunity. And as a result, when they have to compete against somebody who's just come in there with a big growth opportunity or per, perhaps a marketing opportunity, Theirs is seen as a little bit of a weird shade of green. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of our counterparts at the companies that were given the sustainability function have been marginalized within their company over the years. Kurt, I'll, so I'll leave Kurt's it got a completely different yeah, so I, I, I'd, I'd probably answer it in a slightly different way. I think there are two barriers to, to really capitalizing on the energy efficiency opportunity lack of information and payback period. You know, the first is just a matter of transparency. Do you understand what you're paying for your energy and, and, and what steps you could take to reduce that, that cost? And it doesn't matter if you rent an apartment, own a home, or run a company. If you don't have that information and know what to do with that information, you're not going to act on it. The second is, is payback period. And uh, you know, a ton of research has been done on it. And, Again, be it a homeowner or a, a company, if the payback period on investment in energy efficiency is, in the case of, an, of a homeowner, less than a year, chances are homeowners will, will invest in it. If it's a company, I don't care if it's a $20 million company or a $20 billion company, if it's two years or less, they'll act on it. If it's more than two years, they will not act on it. They'll, they'll audit their facility, they'll identify those, those, those investments they can make that have short payback periods, anything that's over two years, they'll put that recommendation in a binder and they'll put it on the shelf. And so really the, the challenge is what, what set of policy constructs can you put forward that help increase transparency into, into what efficient, what energy use looks like, and can you provide financing mechanisms or, or other mechanisms that help you get over that, uh, that payback period uh, quandary. So I just, may I chime in really quickly? Uh, just from, uh, so the utility, the energy efficiency utility is, is responsible for setting up efficiency rebate programs. I don't know if I addressed that earlier, but one of the things that we do is try to take some of the ratepayer dollars and, and return it back to DC uh, here through uh, energy projects um, and other programs that support energy savings uh, projects in the district. It is really hard to give away money. It will blow you away, um, you know, to hang an incentive check in front of somebody and to not have them bite, even with an economic analysis behind it that uh, demonstrates the cash flow that you want. Um, and I think that's baffling, you know, as you're, as you're trying to set up the, you know, you have, it makes perfect sense to you and it's a, a struggle. So that's a barrier. Um, and I think it has a little bit to do with a lack of communication, a lack of a point person or one person that's responsible for sort of coordinating this within a firm or a top-down commitment to um, whether it's a corporate sustainability mandate or it's uh, energy efficiency integrated into your assembly line. Um, if you don't have that leader within the company, you will leave that money on the table. And it's surprising. Um, and the other thing I would mention is that uh, dealing with some of the companies there's a uh, transportation company that's really big in DC that runs a med that runs a subway. But they, uh, there's a lot of risk aversion to new technology, right. and it's not that new. You know, the technology is not that new, but they run such a large, large operation that they can't really take on that risk. And so I would say that risk aversion and a lack of a of a leader um, are barriers that 
that's, that we see in the way of taking money. So I'm, I'm going to talk too much, but just uh, a great example. So when President Obama took office and, and they put together the stimulus package, one of the things that they did is they took the existing tax credit for energy efficiency property, for things like doors, windows, air conditioning systems, heating systems. And that, the maximum credit, I think, is 125 bucks. And they tripled the, the amount of the credit. It was 500, it went to 15. That's, that's right. It went from 500, went up to 1,500. At 1,500 bucks, people, that, care. people came. They flooded and, mm -hmm. and to use it. After two years, the credit went back down to its, to its initial level. The credit flatlined. Nobody used it. So let me jump so in it's, on it's that. To your point, it's getting people to right. grab and, the money. And I think that's a key point. It's, you know, we, we look at it in energy efficiency. You add it all up, and you can get big savings, and you can see millions of dollars as a company, but it's picking up pennies at a time. You know, that's, that's kind of the issue with it, is it's small changes, and is that going to matter? You know, you try to talk to people about changing the light bulbs in their homes. Well, yes, over time, that's significant savings, but if you're on a very tight budget, and you know, fortunately now we have, we've, we've basically banned inefficient incandescent light bulbs. Um, and so the, the junk's out of the market. But before, your choice was 25 cents now for a light bulb or 250 for a light bulb. And, you know, do you want to wait for the five years to get all the savings back, or do you just want to pay a quarter now and, you know, spend a little more on dinner that night? That's, that's kind of the, the difficulty, I think, that's there. Um, and, you know, I agree with everything everyone else has said, but I think that's real and that's out there. And companies are focused on what their business is, delivering a product at a great value and, and increasing sales. And so this isn't something that's top of mind for folks. So you have to find a way to break through that and make it meaningful. Kateri, I, I, I want to build off that, which is, I mean, I, I'm hearing all the comments and it, I, in my experience, so I work in higher ed, um, but I follow two industries. One is higher ed because I work in higher ed. The other is the beer industry. And in both cases, it, it, through personal experience, my, my feeling is the same, which is that there's money on the table, but I didn't start a university with the purpose of saving energy. I didn't start a brewery with the purpose of saving energy. I started a university to teach and research. I started a brewery to make beer. So when I have a choice between, I can invest in something that has a, even a one-year payback mm -hmm. on energy, or I can spend time creatively developing a new beer or hiring new faculty, even if the payback is less, it, it may, might even be a, a much harder to measure mm -hmm. than, than energy efficiency, but it's why I got into the business that I'm in. So it sounds like part of the answer is the money has to be big enough to get attention. Um, the, other, the, the other thing that I, that I wonder about and would be my next question is, I think another challenge with energy efficiency is that it's invisible. Mm -hmm. When I walk out of this room, and leave the lights on, I don't get charged. I don't see an impact, personally. Mm -hmm. e even the ins even right. the people who run this building, even the institution that owns the building, it, the neighborhood, the city, I mean, you can go, go out and out, and it's really only at a s global level that we end up understanding that there's an impact from climate change. So how do we, it seems to me that one of the challenges is making the, the money big enough to get attention. The other is making it visible. How do you make the energy efficiency opportunity visible, especially when it comes to behavior changes, not just in investments? So can I, from a, a school perspective, Emily was involved with our, it was called at the time, um, the, the green schools. Now it's called Power Safe Schools. And Aaron was involved in this too. So it, it's a packaging thing. You know, the way you package and the way you message can be very important. So energy savings that were realized by students in the school, working with the facilities managers and working with the teachers, we always tried to make sure that they came back to the school and they could use it for field trips or for new purchases of equipment or something. So from a school perspective, if you can take a look at this, this really goes to what Gina, I think, was saying. You know, look at it as a revenue stream. Look at it as, okay, I'm going to invest and I'm going to save this money, but not just for the sake of saving it. It's because it's going to become my next investment pool. I'm going to be able to improve my beer production or expand it because I'm going to save money that I'm wasting right now and I'm going to spend it in another place. So I think that's part of it. I also think if you take it down to a homeowner's, 
it's got to be what really sells this to your point of making it real comfort you're not going to be cold in the winter you're you know not going to be hot in the summer in your house um, and getting an energy audit where people see how much they're going to save each year so you know they get a, a full audit they get somebody that comes in and says this is what your annual savings are and that starts to mean something you guys I just want to chime in I didn't get to answer the first question but the the with respect to just the challenge why people just leave money on the table you have to pay to play so you do have to put in money in order to get put that money in if it's going to take go back to what you're saying a long time to get it back so the payback period is an issue but it's that there is a cost and the question is how much does that energy efficiency technology cost um, so there's that and then the other thing is just change management from a consulting perspective change management is a term of art in the consulting world and companies don't use a really standardized approach for integrating change management into the workplace and um, so then to the new question there just has to be this link between energy cost reduction and revenue generating um, revenue generation and there needs to be more interplay so for instance if a company comes up with an, uh, a really neat bicycle um, that is used in the gym for cycling exercise and it, it's it's energy star label it has to be that you are selling the fact that it's energy efficient so whoever purchases that the consumer will save money when they buy it but it also means that it's a more more enjoyable experience so it's just a better bicycle and for instance uh, Tesla Tesla is 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 a great car company in the sense that it just so happens to be that the car is an eco-friendly car there are so many other aspects to Tesla that make it a better car it has two trunks that's an example of why it's better. So you have to sell the convenience to the customer as if it's not even green. It's not even an energy efficient technology. It's just better. And these are all the reasons why. In addition, by the way, it's also eco-friendly. And so there needs to be more of that. And that requires strategy with product development. I want to put a fine point on, uh, it's been said, it's echoed here. Um, it's uh, buying is an emotional experience. It's not, it, it, the economics are very important and that they're a logical way of making a business decision. Um, but a lot of the underlying uh, motivations for buying are uh, emotional. I mean, when's the last time you saw a commercial with the cash flow? Yeah. So payback is what the CFO is going to look at. Um, they are going to, you know, factor that in and they're going to try to get it within their payback window. But I've seen projects where they start out and they say, we do a, you know, this is our payback threshold. And then as we start to uncover it a little bit, we find out actually there are other motivators that will allow this project to be excused from that payback criteria. You know, so, you know, for other reasons, if we somehow can appeal to the corporate sustainability, you know, charge or other factors, we can make a project move forward. So. I would say it's not just I think we were out in Nevada in Las Vegas and MGM was talking to us about all of the great works that they're doing and you, you really ought to look on their homepage and see the kind of projects they they're in the economic downturn their stock dropped to like 25 cents a share I mean it was ridiculous they were almost in bankruptcy and the fella that runs their energy services and management said that he never took a project to his c-suite that got turned down during that period and it was because they had proven all before the downturn that they were going to deliver real money to the company that could be used in other ways so even when they're flat on their back they were able to find a way and I think that I bring that up because the more that happens the more UTC's that are out there talking about the fact that they're able to grow their business by 13% while reducing real energy consumption by 40% or whatever your numbers are People sit up and listen. I mean, I'm an advocate for energy efficiency. I can talk about it till I'm blue in the face, and the CFO isn't going to listen to me. If their competitor, if a leader is taking that action, they will follow suit. And I think that's what 
so important about what you're doing um, with WWF, what companies are doing, and quite frankly, what the government's doing, because they're the largest single energy user. And so the administration after administration, it's not just Obama, it was Bush before him, it was, um, it was or, uh, excuse me, Clinton before him, it was Bush one before him, all the way back to Reagan. They've been focusing on improving energy management in the federal government, and that's really helped to change the market. So that leadership shouldn't be undervalued in any, any way, shape, or form. I have so many more questions, um, and I know that we don't have we don't have enough time for us all to stay here until we get blue in the face. So I want to make an offer and then one more question and then open it up to the audience. The offer is that I have ideas in mind for things that AU could do with actually each and every one of you on the panel. Um, so if you have two minutes after after the panel, or if I can follow up, I've got specific ideas actually for every one of you. So if you're looking for a university partner, here we are. Um, my, my final question before we open it up is, um, we've got a lot of students here, a, a number of whom I know are graduating in just a month or so. Um, so two, two sides of this question. One is, what, are, what do you see as the most promising business opportunities? And with that, what do you see as the most promising job opportunities in energy efficiency? Well, I can, I can speak to um, some of those things. We have to remember when we talk about energy efficiency that this is global. This is not just the United States of America when we think of energy efficiency. There is so much opportunity uh, in other countries when it comes to energy efficiency. Uh, Russia, for instance, um, and uh, some parts of sub Saharan Africa, uh, there's a big push for uh, energy efficiency um, because of the cost associated with. Uh, the infrastructure and the energy to operate it. Um, and with the United States, we are faced right now with the dilemma of aging infrastructure. And so we're going to see a lot of redevelopment, new development happening. Um, so uh, from a kind of like a construction um, design standpoint, I'd say that there's there's a big market for, for lead certification um, and any type of energy certification, energy efficiency certification, um, getting that credential, uh, you know, Aaron, you're, you're a lead GA, um, getting that credential is important. It is, it is the future. It's in over 400 uh, bodies of law uh, in different, over 400 localities in the United States. Um, so there's a huge market for that. So. so if I were you guys, and, and I wanted kind of a, a, a career in, in, in this industry broadly, I think I would kind of focus on the five challenges of energy efficiency. You all would focus on four of them because the first challenge is the engineering challenge. And I don't think we have engineers in the room, so we'll, we'll, we'll table that. And so, oh, there you go. <laughs> you know, and, and my company, we're a company of engineers, and that's... That's what we hire. We, you know, we hire people to tackle those engineering problems, be it to, to help us figure out how to use low global warming potential refrigerants or more efficient airplane engines. But uh, the other four challenges, it gets back to the conversation we had. It's think about those companies that are trying to tackle the transparency issue. So the companies like Opower in Arlington or Nest. Uh, or heck, any of the green building rating systems. Again, that's just a, a tool for, for, for transparency. Finance, um, you know, an enormous uh, challenge for, for driving energy efficiency is, is financing. One tool that's being used to, to tackle the financing issue, particularly for schools, universities, is the energy service company model, the ESCO model. It's an enormous growth industry. So th that's another area that you the third challenge is measurement and verification. You, know, you talk about energy efficiency until you're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, you've got to measure it and verify it and give it a value. You've got to be able to, to demonstrate that this person taking these set of, sets of action here reduced in, re result in reduced emissions over here. So measurement and verification is a, is a, a massive growth issue. 
uh, opportunity. And then the final challenge is scale. At the end of the day, companies aren't going to invest in efficiency if they win customers one at a time by knocking at doors. They want to figure out how they can how they can scale these opportunities and drive efficiencies at, at the at the block le level, at the city level, at, at, at the state level. So. I would think about efficiency in kind of those four areas and, and how I would want to begin to tackle that problem and think about creative solutions. And you can do that in the public policy arena. You can do it as a, a, with an MBA. You can do it with a sustainability degree. But I think those are the, those are the core issues that, that companies, that cities, that utilities, that universities are, are all going to be grappling with. I think that's brilliant. I, I and spot on advice. The only thing I would add to it is I think we're on a, a really the front end of what will be a, a very interesting, I hope fun and, and fruitful ride with our uh, utility industries. I, I think you know there's a, a lot of discussion now about what will the utility of the 21st century look like and you know, we're getting ready to blow up the model that's 100 and what, 120 years old now or so. Um, Praise the Lord. Tons, yeah, tons of opportunity there. So I think look at that both within the utility industry where they're expecting about half, I think, of their workforce to retire just mm -hmm. in the next couple of years. And look at, you know, if it's, if it's not your mom's and dad's utility, what is it going to be? And look at the companies that are trying to create something new. I mean, to me, that's, it's really exciting, exciting stuff. And it is, it is we couldn't be more on the front end of that than we are right now. Um, I think my comments would be the the career path of the past is no longer. Um, you know, you know, you'll see it in like Wall Street Journal and Forbes. They're all talking about what is it, a four point four year? You know, you have a job stint and then you move on to the next, or what, the seven career lifetime. Um, you, you're. There's a lot of room to bounce. So what I would say, the, the best business advice would be to figure out what motivates you first and then build a skill set, uh, interests and skill sets around it and find a mentor um, to help navigate the waters. Because it's rough out there. I mean, it really is. Energy is a, an, an excellent industry to be in. There's a lot of flexibility of where you can, how you can exercise your skill set. So if it's finance, there's a lot of room for that. I know there's some energy finance in the room. If it's climbing in boiler rooms and on rooftops, there's plenty of space for that for you too. Um, it could be in renewables. Uh, it could be exercising your entrepreneurial spirit, um, starting a you know a, a technical products line. So there's a lot of room. Um, so I, th I think finding a good advisor or finding a good mentor would be my recommendation, and um, have fun with it. Follow a couple couple different companies that you really like. So you uh, United Technologies is a great great firm just to track their leader and so if you want to see what's happening in the forefront of this work you might want to go there GE ARPA E is also another group that I that I like to track. Um, building off of what Kurt was saying about O power and Nest, I mean I think it sort of goes without saying that apps are where it's at. Um, <laughs> Anything, you know, we always say throughout this field, um, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get managed. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that are trying to find neat ways to, to measure things better. Whether it's, you know, these fitness bands that everyone's running around with that show the number of steps you're taking. You but, well, that's what we need for energy. I mean, that we need we need something that, that inspires that kind of competition. I mean, we've got people in our office that are fighting tooth and nail to, to see who takes the most steps. Well, you should be fighting to find out how many green electrons you have or or how many you can or dirty electrons you can reduce um, so i think that's a big big opportunity last week i was at the wall street journal economics conference in santa barbara and every industry was represented there so th there are opportunities in this field across every sector of the economy i'll make one last um, pitch for the environmental community um, is a really unique place to be right now because um, all these industries are going through a massive transition. And as a result, the companies are coming to us if they've been attacked by Greenpeace or to, to come up with a plan. And they, they don't want just any plan. They want a creative plan that sets them apart from all of their peers. And they turn to us to help, help build that unique plan. 
um, we also are doing a lot of campaigning. And so right now there's a big campaign and you'll start to see posters in bus depots that says renewable, it's doable. And it's a rooftop solar campaign. Um, right before Copenhagen via our Climate Savers uh, partnership program, we had a let the clean economy begin campaign. So this kind of campaigning and awareness building among um, the American public is, is important because we're not quite at the level of a lot of other countries that have taken on this challenge with more serious vigor. Lots of great advice from professionals who are doing this stuff and leading the way, so let's get a couple questions. <clears throat> so something that Chris and I have debated before is, um, I guess something that we have been focused on here on campus is fuel switching. And that tends to be kind of the sexy part of energy is renewable energy, solar generation. Uh, we purchase wind renewable energy credits for all of our um, electricity here on campus. So when you're talking about fuel switching versus fuel saving, I guess, um, what is your thoughts about energy efficiency being more of a virtue than an actual kind of strategy for climate change production? So are you, just so I know, are you, so you're basically comparing like solar energy strategy versus energy efficiency strategy? Yeah. Okay. So renewables are neat, but they're still less than 10% of fuel mix in the United States. And so mm -hmm. the name of the game is how do you reduce usage of fossil fuels? And, and, and so... No number of, of purchased wind or solar credits are, are, are going to get us to where we need to be. We need to, again, I think, get back to what Kateri would talk so much about, is how we make the most productive use of the carbon fuels that we expend possible, be it for transportation fuels or, or for, for electricity. Right. And also, I would say to that, I agree with that completely, um, to the extent that solar and wind remained more expensive than baseload coal-fired capacity. What you want to do is make sure you get the energy efficiency of the building that you're serving as low as it can go, and that helps to make the economic case for the renewable energy. So I don't think you can do one without the other. I don't think it's something that it's, you know, it's, it's I forget the word that you use, that, you know, it's just like the morally right thing to do. I think it, it makes the economics work. So don't want to do those. It, it makes no sense to put solar on a building that's leaking and you know just running the energy out. It just doesn't make any sense, economic or otherwise. I, I think it also has to do with really what country you're in. Because if you're in Sudan or South Sudan or Ghana or Kenya, this is a totally opposite reality. It's that you can't you don't even have stable any stable electric electricity supply. So you need the, something that's going to be more reliable. If the power of the sun is better in that region of the world, then it makes sense for them to use solar. It's just a better business case. We have little infrastructure, better sun power. It's going to be more reliable. You have, you don't, if you're in any of those countries, you're going to have a blackout multiple times a day. You can't use your cell phone. You can't use the internet. It really disrupts business practices. And it's extremely expensive to use traditional fuel. It has nothing to do with the environment or wanting to reduce the use of fossil-based fuel. It literally is 100% just completely inconvenient to use fossil-based fuel. So it's, they'd rather use solar energy sometimes in those regions of the world. The United States has an opposite reality. The United States is a developed country. There's lots of infrastructure. We have options. We can pick and choose an energy supply. So in that sense, it, it's about, it is strictly about, it becomes a sustainability issue, you know, reducing the fossil-based fuel to protect the environment and to cut costs and, um, and using things hand-in-hand, -hand, using an energy efficiency model with solar energy integrated. So it, it just depends really where you are. There are so many facets to this that we could go down, <laughs> and that is a whole side of this that we, have, we haven't really talked about justice related to energy supply, but so we could have a whole other discussion about that. 
Um, but I'm going to call moderator's prerogative here and ask one more question myself, <laughs> and then turn it back to the crowd. Um, because I want to push you guys, because I think you'll have a good answer on this, um, on the argument that, well, actually, as we get more efficient, we, we continue to use more energy. In other words, you know, to, to drive the point home, <laughs> no pun intended, I just replaced my Toyota Yaris with, you know, 30-some miles to a gallon with the Prius, 50-some miles to a gallon. I haven't measured this to the mm -hmm. point that's been made many times, which is you got to measure things. But my gut sense is that I'm driving more, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm probably using I, I don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but I feel like I'm driving more because I have this sense that well I'm getting such great mm -hmm. mileage. I can I could just I, I could drive this time instead of take the metro, go out of my way to use transit when I know I should. But I get such great mileage. So what about you know this argument that as we increase efficiency we also, you know, there's the classic case of people who get the smiley face and the frowny face in their utility bills. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to be like the average. So if, if, if the message is you're doing better than most people, then you have license to use a little more. Unless you somehow get into the psychology of telling people, no, the less you use, the better. So what do we do about that? Do, if, or do we just, the more efficient we get, does that excuse us to use more energy? I don't think it necessarily excuses us to use more energy. I mean, from the Alliance's perspective, you know, you're, you're not asking people, this is not the Jimmy Carter days, put on a sweater and suffer through it. Um, a refrigerator today is, what, 40% bigger than one in the 70s. It has more functionality, lasts longer, and it uses 25% of the energy. Um, that's kind of the model we want. You're driving a more efficient car, you're driving more, hopefully you're at a point though, even though you're driving more, you're using less energy. When we did the economic analysis of doubling energy productivity in the United States, what it showed was for the first time, the lines would cross. The lines have tracked as our economy has improved, energy, growth in energy demand has gone up. And, and we've been shaving that off and it's gone some, but if we double energy productivity, it goes like this. We keep growing the economy, and in real terms, we lose, use less energy. So I take it the cornucopias, you know, the, this, this whole notion of if you save more, you're going to use more. But what we're actually finding is that that's not the case. We're getting more from each unit of energy, so we're not needing as much. We're having a, a, as good or a better quality of life using less energy. So one more data point on that. I think houses now are... Um, it, and fortunately, they're going down the other side. We're starting to build smaller, but that's got more to do with the economy, much more than energy use. Um, and it's just not trendy any longer. But houses, the average house is about 30% larger than it was even 15, 20 years ago. They're not using any more energy in that home. And think about the explosion in the last 30 years of everything we're plugging in, the plug loads mm -hmm. in those homes. So, you know, I, I would say there's, there's just not a downside to it. And... We are going to want more and want an increased quality of life, and we have to figure out how to deliver that in a smarter way and squeeze more and more and more out of the energy that we're using. So the numbers support energy efficiency. That's that's yeah. That's I don't, sure. Do you have anything different on it? I would say I mean it's happening. It's inevitable that uh, demand EIA says demand is going to increase by 31 percent over the next uh, 25 years of that electricity uh, demand for fuels. Um, U.S. electricity, 40% of that um, is going is slated to increase uh, by 20, th 32, thereabouts, but 40% increase in electricity demand. I mean, those are big, staggering numbers that it's a hard pill to swallow, but I, I think we have to be aware of them now. We have to get our large uh, manufacturing, uh, you know, our big energy users on board to um, implement best practices to keep energy efficiency a priority. Um, and, you know, back a little bit to Emily's question earlier, you know, there is an order of operation to these things. It's a, you know, I, we think it's um, conservation first, behavioral, uh, and then it's energy efficiency. Implement as much energy efficiency that you can to tighten your buildings and your operations. And then look at renewables and look at offsetting or generating. And I think if we keep those things in mind, we can try to we can try to keep that curve bending down. Bending. <laughs> so I think. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say, when when you look at it globally, there is going to be a huge uh, surge in demand for electricity across the globe. Um, 
So, unfortunately, that 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 argument, those statistics, what they're saying is that we're actually going to be increasing our energy consumption. Um, so that's where green energy, when I say green energy, I'm talking about renewable energy. That's where solar, wind, biofuels become such a beautiful thing. Because if there are people who are naysayers in the United States that say, well, the more energy efficient we are, then the more energy we use, that argument kind of, okay, if that's the case, it's okay, as long as that energy is coming from the sun, is coming from the wind, is coming from plants. Um, so the other thing that we do have to remember is that energy is important. We do create a lot of jobs from oil, gas, um, and other forms of energy. Uh, our economy does depend in some way on, on this type of on those types of energy. So it is important to keep in mind the energy mix, the all of the above approach for energy. So just just a reminder of what the world's going to look like in the next 20 years. So we, we own the, the world's biggest elevator company, Otis Elevator. Last year, there were 600,000 new elevator permits issued worldwide. So building a new building or you're rehabbing a building, you're putting in a new elevator, you get a permit, 600,000 worldwide. 15,000 of those permits were issued in the United States. 470,000 of those permits were issued in China. Wow. Mm -hmm. you know, China, China builds a new, a new New York every three years. Yeah. Metropolis of, of 15, 20 million people every three years. So. I think it's to your point that the world's going to use more energy going forward. It's become more urbanized. It's going to become more affluent. Uh, so the challenges here are, are, are dwarfed probably by the challenges in, in places like India and, and China and, and Africa. A couple of those permits were for a building we renovated last summer. And, uh, <laughs> I need to go check and make sure those were votes. I'm not sure if they are, but I do know this, to, to the point about energy efficiency, which is that we replaced the elevators with ones that had regenerative braking. Those are mm -hmm. ours. Yeah. So I, so I know that you know, some of those permits were energy efficient. OK, let's, let's try to take another question or two, because I know we promised that we would only hold you guys till about 8.30. So um, I'm going to try to keep us to that. Um, I just had, well, I have two questions. One about um, where the energy efficiency um, business case is going with the um, knowledge that our um, fuels, our fossil fuels, our gas, and our oil production is going up. Like, will, I mean, how will that adjust the, I guess, the pitch for the energy efficiency case? And then um, on the international side, if you're, um, if we're in the United States um, saying that we'll produce more for each unit um, of energy that we use, but then when there's like the Chinas and the Indias of the world, and I mean, their demand is going to grow exponentially, mm -hmm. it's like hard to tell them that you have to be energy efficient and you really have to, I mean, this is going to happen, I mean, gloom and doom, but they are looking at the U.S. as somewhat of their market of development. Like, how do you um, balance those two? So, I think, from an international perspective, I to be perfectly honest, I think it's a mistake for for countries like India and China to look to the United States for its model for development because we're developed; they're not. China is on its way, and they need to come up with their own strategy on infrastructure. Uh, they do need to pay attention to energy efficiency, but they're they're just it's a privilege to be able to say, let's be energy efficient. That is truly a privilege that the United States has. Um, but the United States is telling them, I mean, to be energy efficient. Right? And that and that's a problem. Yeah. I don't think I mean, if you look at what China is doing actually in their building codes, in their uh, requirements on vehicles, they're kicking our butts. I mean, they're putting much, much more stringent requirements in place. And because it's a command and control economy, it's 
that does what Beijing says to do. And so I, you know, I, I, I beg to differ. I mean, it, they're they're growing so fast, and yes, they're they're putting on coal-fired capacity, and they're doing a lot of that. But they recognize that to be globally competitive, they need not they they need to not waste their energy. They're already importing coal. They you know they they know that they've got to get control over this. So. I don't see in the case of India, I mean, in the case of China, that they're not there. I think that they're very much trying to do it. And I think from the U.S. perspective, the reason to try to get more and more energy productive is so that we can compete. Because we can't compete with China in labor costs. You know, but if we can, if the reason you're seeing, on, you're seeing uh, a resurgence in manufacturing and in industries here, and particularly in the petrochemical industry, is because our energy prices are low. So we got to find ways to keep them low, right? And now there's this big push to export natural gas. Well, there's going to be a lot of tug and pull back and forth because if we export it, that means the price is going to start to rise to more of the global. So how do we how do we manage that? One way is to make sure that we get ourselves to be energy productive and energy efficient so we don't need as much of it and we can send more offshore and make money from that. We're, so. we're, not, we're not telling China to do anything. We, exactly. don't, we don't need to. Near-term environmental imperatives are going to drive China to figure out how mm -hmm. they burn less coal, right. uh, move to cleaner alternative forms of energy. I mean, their waters are polluted. If you go to Beijing, you can't breathe. On a good day in Beijing is like smoking three packs of cigarettes, just, just walking around. And, and people are and You could probably speak it. to this better than anybody, but they're citizenry. They're going to revolt if, yeah. if that kind of environmental conditions persist. Well, they are. I mean, and the five-year plan calls for major scale-up and efficiency in renewables. Um, you know, that yes, they're building more coal plants, but at the same time, the the amount of wind capacity that's oh, been geez. added there is like ten times anywhere else on the planet. So. Um, and this, they're flooding the market with solar panels. I mean, the reason that solar has come down is because of the Chinese capacity to build solar. The reason we can, you know, have solar here in D.C. at, at an affordable rate is because you can get Chinese solar panels at a, at a much lower cost than it was, you know, even just two years ago. So, yeah. Take one more question. Um. So I read a little bit about um, some corporations starting to put a cost of carbon onto their books. Um, so for example, Walt Disney and Microsoft, I believe, are some examples. Um, and Matt, working with some companies, I don't know if you've seen some of this or other people have. Um, so I'm curious what you think um, is sort of the mentality behind that, what they're planning on, where they're getting those prices from. Um, and then alongside of that, too, um, within sort of some sort of cap and trade system, um, what you think the future of that will be. Prices have really dropped recently. Um, I was just reading this morning that some of the volumes dropped in 2013 too, because traditionally in the past the price was dropping, but at least the volumes were increasing. Mm -hmm. um, so now it seems they're both decreasing a bit. Um, so if anyone knows a bit about either of those. Well, there's kind of two questions embedded right. in that, so I'll <laughs> unpack the first one. Um, a lot of companies are, are using this idea of a carbon tax because it creates a level playing field within the com company, and the departments basically uh, compete with one another to lower their carbon footprint. Um, that also generates some revenue that can be used for energy efficiency um, or for to find alternatives to flying. Um, TJ DiCaprio at and Microsoft has really kind of pioneered this, and the work that she went through to get the buy-in across that company was unbelievable. It's amazing. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do, but I think it's it's a smart thing to do. It's akin to the carbon tax debate that's going on um, with respect to the United States, and this these are kind of microcosms where companies are trying it, and I think it's working. Um, they're using it to generate funds and create a capital relief fund for energy efficiency, for renewables, and really help decarbonize the company. So I think it's a smart solution, and a lot of other companies are looking at it. We know um, a lot of companies in our portfolio are taking a look at it. Um, so are companies also using it in order to decide whether they're going to take on a project or not? Like yeah, I think you can it? take on bigger projects if you can create a fund, a, a pool of funding that allows you to do bigger, better things and expand your your 
sure, climate thinking, protection strategy. Like, you know, when they're comparing two different projects, if one is a bit more carbon intensive than things, so there's a price on, yeah. it, on the carbon, so then that makes that project more expensive. Um, so then they would not, you know, if we're talking about a car manufacturer or something, maybe they won't decide to do this project, this car, or this um, advancement in the vehicle. Or is that, I that's not really the, the reasoning of what No, I haven't on. seen that play out. One, uh, there's a company that we work with that was part of the Johnson family of companies called Johnson Diverse, Diversity. Now they're just called Diversity. I think they just got um, bought by Sealed Air. Anyway, they were using a carbon adder for all their projects in the way that you're describing. And they were comparing projects in the Midwest versus California. And because the grid is not as dirty in California and they had an opportunity to reduce more carbon in Wisconsin, even though that project was more expensive, they did invest in that project. So I, I do think that there's an opportunity to use those carbon numbers to so, identify the right kinds of projects. So we do a cost of carbon on every product we bring to market, not only on the kind of the product that we sell, but on our manufacturing process. So when kind of manufacturing engineers come in and try and figure out how they're going to set up the manufacturing line, what sort of what sort of uh, materials that they're going to source to to to, uh, to build a product. They'll, they'll look for that low cost processing or process manufacturing uh, step. Uh, kind of as a company, be kind of the more immediate thing than cost of carbon, and that's kind of an internal accounting, is resiliency planning. And this is something that we do internally, but also it's kind of forced on by uh, insurance companies, by lenders, is that they want to know that whenever you're making an investment in a new facility, or upgrades at an existing facility that you've taken into consideration what, what climate change is going to do to, to that facility. Have you, have you hardened it for uh, future extreme weather events? Is it going to be under six inches of water in 20, in 20 years? You know, we used to put a lot of our facilities down in, in, in southern Florida. You know, we're not thinking about southern Florida going forward for, for, for new manufacturing. It kills me to stop this conversation <laughs> <laughs> because I know we could all go on about this. It's it's our passion and it's our work, uh, but I want to respect everyone's time. So I want to thank Gina, Matt, Danielle, Kurt, Katiri, Aaron for organizing this panel. You've all been very generous with your time, especially given the need to reschedule this due to weather. Who knows, maybe climate change had something to do with that. Um, but I want to thank everyone for, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.